O Creator God and Sustainer of all life, draw us together in this place in the name of your Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. Teach us more about you. You help us to celebrate your majesty and to experience your blessings in our lives. As we are gathered now before you, women, men, boys and girls, all equal in the sight of the Lord, God is us a Father, and in Christ we are one. Therefore, greet one another in the certainty of love and belonging. I greet you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I would uh, ask Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the Word of God. <clears throat> Praise God and another beautiful day to be able to read the Word of the Lord to you guys. And um, Yeah, it's great being here with Brother Johnson. He's uh, such an inspiration to me and I know he is to all you guys as well so I encourage you to pray for him and pray that the Lord will lead him in everything he does as um, as is happening. As Johnson mentioned uh, I'll be reading from Mark 10 1 to 12 and that's uh, where Jesus talks uh, teaches about marriage and divorces. Jesus then left that place and went into a region of Judea and across the Jordan, again crowds of people came to him, and as it was custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did, what did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law? Jesus replied, But at the beginning of creation God made them male and female. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. Praise God. So, yeah, we've really got to strive to uh, make our marriages last by the sounds of that. But we'll get Johnson back to share what he's got for this Bible verse. Thanks, Johnson. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. <clears throat> uh, today, I've come up with a theme. What does the Bible really say about divorce? It's uh, more of a teaching sermon. What does the Bible really say about divorce? It's a really tough text. In generation past, this would have provided no problem for the preacher. Jesus says, no divorce. And what does the church say? Amen. <laughs> Along with most polite society, case closed. But these days, things are different. Jesus still says, no divorce. But only part of the church says, amen. While other parts says, we are not sure. And the polite society says, mind your own business. Case not closed at all. So our lesson from Mark's gospel is about marriage. It is also about the more painful subject of divorce. I suspect the fragility of families today partially explains the nostalgia many people have in marriages. We live in a world very different from 2,000 years ago. In some ways, things are better now. Technologies are added to our lives, such things as HD TV, smartphones, other material goodies. With these changes, however, have come longer working hours, more stress, more meals away from home, more disposable income and less free time to enjoy it. One chance has been particularly noticeable is the destruction of many families. 
We live in a different world today, a world of single parent families, two income families, blended families, and large key kids. Everyone is in this room has probably been touched by a divorce or a dysfunctional marital relationship in one way or another. You may have been through a divorce yourself, or perhaps it's been your son or daughter, your sister or brother, or a close friend. You may be a child of divorced parents, or perhaps you'll be a scars not from a divorce, but from a father and mother who maintained their marriage relationship, but were so abusive to one another that it would have been better if their marriage had never taken place. So Jesus' teaching on marriage and divorce are important to you, even if you have decided to remain single. Perhaps if you are divorced, Jesus' teaching has been used against you, and if pain added to the heartbreak of a broken marital relationship by the reaction of so-called Christian family members or friends. As someone has said, we are the only army that shoots its wounded. That's not altogether true. But let's wrestle with Jesus' teaching for a few moments. If though they may trouble some of us, some Pharisees came to test Jesus. They were not honest seekers who were coming to learn from him. They were enemies who were trying to catch him in violation of the law of Jesus, of Moses. They test him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? This was the question. So you need to understand that divorce was quite common in Jesus' time, just as it is today. It was a different social situation from our own, however. Women were basically property. Often they were sold by their families to men whom they thought would bring the family land or other real property. As a property, women were sometimes disposed of quite cruel. The beautiful picture from these first chapters of Genesis of uh, women created for men's side as an equal in the marital relationship have never been quite realized. Some say it is, it is it isn't, it has never been realized even up to now. Notice that the Pharisees didn't ask, is it lawful for a man <coughs> or a woman to divorce? They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? It would be unthinkable in that culture for a woman to divorce her husband. So marriage was unequal. Still, it was about the legal protection that a woman had. If her husband threw her out, a woman would probably be consigned to a life of abject poverty. If she had no family to take care, she would starve or turn to begging or prostituting herself to survive. She might even lose the children since the children too were proper to the father, to their fathers. So these one-sided arrangements were protected by the religious establishment. To be sure, there was controversy in the religious community over reasons why husbands could divorce their wives. One prominent rabbi named Shami said that divorce was allowable only for adultery and infertility. However, another prominent rabbi named Hillel told that and anything the woman did that displeased her husband was grounds for divorce. Just burning a toast, scratch the bump of the car, including his finding someone else he liked better. You would divorce the wife. This was the historical situation. This explains Jesus' answer to the Pharisees. What did Moses command you to do? Jesus asked, him, turning the question back to the Pharisees. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. To this, Jesus gave an interesting answer that surely shocked the Pharisees. It was because your hearts were hard, he said, that Moses wrote you this law. What did Jesus mean by this? Think of it this way. In the time of Moses, men were abandoning their wives. And why not? If they were simply property, why not trade them for the latest model? Human nature really has not changed much over the past 3,500 years ago. In the light of what was already happening among the people, Moses commanded the men to at least give the woman 
they were abandoning a certificate of divorce. That, that way she would at least be free to remarry. Meaning she's no longer belonging to me. Anyone can take her. Without that certificate, technically she was still the property of a former husband. So Moses was trying in a small way to give women some protection. Not enough quite obviously, but it was a step in the right direction. So this was a radical step towards civil rights. For it made a man think twice before sending his wife away. Moses always gave protection to the wife and limited abuses of divorce. However, Jesus wanted the Pharisees to know that Moses did not go far, very far enough. What Jesus wanted to see was that even the religious scholars had missed the whole point of the relation between men and women. People are not proper regardless of their gender. So, perhaps, are not things to be used then disposed of. So relationships are sacred, especially the marriage relationship. Jesus doesn't appeal to the law of Moses as his authority. He goes further back to the story of creation. When God created everything. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. He says to them, then goes back to the second chapter of Genesis. But at the beginning of creation, Jesus continues, God made them male and female meaning that he made them together. So for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and that the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Did you catch that? He is not talking about property rights. He is not talking about illegalities. He is talking about two people merging into their real estate, but their hearts, their souls, their minds are together. Isn't that how most of us approach the marriage relationship? Those of us who are married or have been married, we sincerely wanted to become one with our partner. That was the issue. We must not enter marriage with the option of getting out. Your marriage is more likely to be happy if from the outset you committed to permanence. Don't be hard-hearted like the, these Pharisees, but be hard-headed in your determination with God's help to stay together. You are staying, we will stay together no matter what happens. If that is not how you approach marriage, then shame on you. If you got married with the idea up front that, oh well, if this doesn't work out, I can move on to someone else. You are too immature and self-involved in marriage in the first place. You should not involve yourself in marriage. Because you don't understand what marriage is all about. So we approach God's altar and ask God's blessing on our choice of a bride or a groom with the idea that this is one and this is forever. So that's why the breakup of a marriage is so painful. So much hope, so much faith, so much love was invested in this relationship. For some people, it is as the very heart is torn out of them. So Jesus was to see that right from the beginning, this is what God wanted for his children. The marriage relationship is God's gift to us. It is God's way of providing a lover, a helpmate, someone who would always be there for us. Someone who is there to support us, to help us. So God never intended for men to treat women like property or women to treat men like that for what matter if it wasn't encoded in the Mosaic law. So God is something much, much more better in mind for us. So they are no longer two, but one in flesh. This was the God's idea. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Let no one separate. So the Hebrew words for male and female reveal that the two were made complementary for each other. So God's plan was that in marriage, the husband and wife become one flesh. <clears throat> An intimate closeness that cannot be separated. So the wife is not a property to be disposed, but an equal, equally created person in marriage. Today, many homosexuals want to commit to marry with the blessing of the church. Reasons for homosexual feelings and desires are complex and serious. At creation, he approved one kind of marriage, bond men to women. 
they become one flesh, one before God. If you want to read it for yourself, Romans 1 verse 24, even up to 28. Where does that leave homosexual, <coughs> homosexual marriages? At best, it is a human invasion without any biblical precedent. God created men and women. Full stop. Considering the morals of the society of Jesus' time, when women still could be abandoned so easily, this was quite a shocking teaching. Even the disciples asked Jesus to clarify what he meant. His reply to his disciples was even more pointed. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So in other words, he was saying to his disciples, forget everything you ever heard about marriage and divorce. Here's how it is. Marriage is a sacred event. Divorce is a sin. So those are strong words. I know they make me uncomfortable and even make you uncomfortable. But notice this. If anybody ever asks you, what does the Bible say about divorce? Tell them quite properly. It depends on where you look. Moses says in Deuteronomy 24 verse 1, a man can give a wife a certificate of divorce and walk away having fulfilled the law. Then Jesus says that if you divorce and remarry, it is adultery. So he answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So scholars agree that Jesus always referred to both husband and wife. That is, the unfaithfulness of one could be the grounds for divorce by the other because Jesus then added, and if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. These words were earth-shaking words to Jewish ears. In Jewish society, only men had the right to divorce. Jesus says, if she divorces her husband, were a departure from the normal Jewish understanding. Because only men have the right to divorce, not women. Mark alone recorded these words probably with his Roman audience in mind. They would not have been shocked for, in Roman society, a woman could initiate a divorce. Then in St. Paul, who remember wrote years after Christ's death and resurrection in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10 to 16, suggests that it would be acceptable for a believer to divorce an unbeliever. So we have three different views on this important subject by the three leading lights in scripture. Of course, Jesus is one true light, so we have to give his teaching priority. What did Jesus say? We go with what Jesus said. But notice that St. Paul felt emboldened to amend Jesus' teaching. This says to me that he understood that Jesus was not giving us a legalistic formula for marriage and divorce when he gave his answer to the Pharisees. He was answering a specific question with a specific context. The Pharisees were looking for a loophole. Is it legal for a man to divorce his wife? And Jesus didn't really worry that much about what was legal. He worried more about the effect of divorce on people. Good people were being damaged by the abuses of the marriage contract in this time. So he wanted them to see that this was not what God intended in marriage in the first place. Marriage is permanent. Marriage is a gift of God. It's bestowed upon human beings. The gift of sexuality, the gift of a lasting relationship, the gift of affirming love, Jesus wanted them to focus on the gift and not on the law. A lot of people focus on the law and not on the gift. Divorce happens. It shouldn't happen. Perhaps it does. Jesus knew that. He acknowledged that when he spoke of Moses and the hardness of human hearts, Moses gave his edict because he knew how people were. Some men were going to cast off their wives for no reason. And given the chance, some women will cast off their husband as well. Not every marriage is made in heaven. Some couples marry for all the wrong reasons. People sin. People fail. People fall. 
That's why we have forgiveness. That's why we have grace. Does Jesus condemn divorced people? Is it adultery for a divorced person remarries? Well, even if you take it literally, that is adultery. Remember that Jesus said that even to look upon a woman with lust in your heart is committing adultery. In, in Matthew 5, verse 28. So, how many men are committing adultery on daily basis? Men. Plenty. So Jesus wanted us to focus on the condition of a person's heart. Not a legalistic approach to life. And listen again to his words in John 8 to the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Woman, where are they? Yes, no one condemned you. No one said. She said. Then either do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and live your life of, of sin. So even if we interpret Jesus' words literally to mean that remarriage of a divorced person is a sin, forgiveness is available. So there's no condemnation, not by the master. So for those who have divorced and now think of remarrying, you only need, what you only need is ask for God's forgiveness. And if not by the master, then who just condemn the divorced person? If the tragedy of divorces happened in your life, don't listen to the legalistic Pharisees who would kick you when you are down. Don't listen to them. Divorce is not God's plan for God's children. But divorced people are loved by God just as much as the purest saint. But let's get back to Jesus' main point. Marriage is a gift from God. It is not intended to be a burden, but a blessing. It can be the most wonderful thing that happens to us if our hearts are one with each other as marriage partners and our hearts are one with God. So there was a man whose wife became seriously ill with our major disease. She completely lost all of her memory and the ability to remember who she was or who anyone else was. She was in a nursing home and her husband came by to sit beside her a bed and beside her every day. One of his sons told him that he didn't need to keep doing that because he didn't remember who she was and she didn't remember who he was. The man said, I know she doesn't remember anything, but I do. I remember who she is and I remember who I am. I am the husband who said to her 55 years ago, I will love and cherish you for better, for worse, and sickness and health, and I tend to do just that. So what a gift that man was giving to his wife. A gift like unto one that men of us one day be required to give to the person we love. Even more importantly, what a gift offers humanity, a lifelong partner, to help us through life, joys and sorrows. It doesn't always work that way. Even for the best people. We have seen it. Even for the best people, with all the monies and everything, they seek for divorce for different reasons. So divorce happens. It doesn't make God happy, but neither does it change God's love for the persons involved. And it shouldn't change our attitudes towards them either. May God bless you as you continue to listen and contemplate on these words and meditate upon the word of God. God be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we come to you. We bring before you, Lord, the fragrance of our relationship. The splendors shaved off in a multitude of our arguments. The great ships that have broken off and left us scarred. The parts of us that are shattered completely. We pray for your healing for each one of us. For none of our relationships are perfect. We are cragged to some degree. Help us not to judge our brothers and sisters. But to meet in the interdependence of your love. Let love increase and be shared among us. We give thanks and pray for organizations that offer marriage support. For counseling 
marriage counselors in the church for therapists. We give thanks and pray for organizations that promote children's welfare, for those who help us to see the potential of children in our communities and in the world today. Father, be with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask uh, you brothers and sisters, it's time to, for us to take our offerings as we thank God for what God has done to us. For those who are still together in their marriage, you need to thank God for that because it's not easy. For those who are now single and even are thinking about remarrying, you need again to thank God and make sure you go to the drawing board and consult God before you recommit yourself to something you are not sure. Let us thank God with our families as we bring our offerings. Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings of thanksgiving just saying thank you, Lord, for who we are. We know we are not perfect. We know, Lord Jesus Christ, we are always seeking to be perfect. May you bless us, Father. May you bless this offering. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. Praise, praise God.